welcome to our, this, our first presentation for Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Um, I want you to be advised that we're recording, so keep your language appropriate, please. Um, this week is our, our first presentation. We're, we have uh, Paul Ladansky from Castle Cops. And as a reminder, in two weeks, on the 26th, we're going to have in this room a social security number use forum. We're going to bring a lot of the big wigs in. We're going to talk about how it's going to be used, what our transition strategies are, how it's going to be driven out of IT processes, and how everybody will need to react or, and deal with that. Um, so welcome today. And um, Paul's presentation, we're going to be able to take questions as well. Please step up to the microphone because we are recorded and we can't um, always interpret what the questions are from the answer. So um, please step up to the microphone with your questions. Um, I'm pleased to introduce Paul Odansky. He's an internet crime investigator and he speaks at regular conferences about um, internet crime, mostly from the fraud perspective. And um, he, he's got a sort of a background that's in creating the Castle Cops organization, and you're the president of the Castle Cops group, it's um, aimed at trying to reduce phishing and stop all the crime that comes around from that. Also, being a part of the the digital fish net and um, try to deal with these sort of criminal activities that everyday people, well, I guess they're not everyday, but people on the net are, are perpetrating. And it's pertinent to the university environment as, as well as case because of our openness and our wide open network. Um, we could be victims, we could be perpetrators, we could be part of the whole cycle. So um, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Paul and I'll, please help you, uh, join me in welcoming Paul. Thanks, Tom. Thanks everybody for having me here today and for coming out. Uh, it's always kind of hard to describe what it is that I do because there's so many things that I get involved in out there when it comes to internet security and safety. But I'm going to try to give you a picture about one of our core services today, which is PERT. Uh, phishing is not your friend. Uh, that's something I guess Tom came up with. I figured I'd run with it. Bingo. So this is the basic agenda. Introduction, talk a little bit about Castle Cops, and then the, the biggest two pieces here are number three and four, PERT's approach and, and our value and metrics. Again, as Tom pointed out, I'm the founder of Castle Cops. We are a volunteer organization of uh, at least 120 active volunteers, but we have a registered member user base of about 185,000. We do permit guests. so. You don't have to be registered in order to participate at the community. Uh, I am a Digital Fishnet Technical Advisory member. I'm also a member of InfraGuard Northern Ohio chapter, and Microsoft has seen fit to award me with their most valuable professional award. So I'm not employed by Microsoft, they just decided to, to give me an MVP award for the years 2005, six, and seven, and off topic, my wife has also received the same award. Castle Cops, this is our main URL, www.castlecops.com. Castle Cops is officially an APWG research partner, the Anti-Fishing Working Group, as well as an Anti-Spyware Coalition member. And if you want to read more about us, you can visit that URL at the wiki site. Dives into greater detail. So let's get into what Castle Cops does in so far as internet crime fighting is concerned. We've got three core services here listed at the top, PERT, MERT, and CERT. The IRT stands for Incident Reporting and Termination. So P is for phishing, M is for malware, and S is for spam. We've got uh, about a dozen malware database lists. So these database lists cover things like browser helper objects, Windows startups, Windows services, ActiveX, down the whole gamut for Windows registry items. We specify what's legitimate, what's malware or spyware. There's a lot of companies and organizations that use that data to help protect their internal customers. We also offer TCP and UDP port scanners. Anybody wants to come in and test their firewall settings, they can do that, we'll go ahead and scan them. We've got a couple of academies set up where we'll teach people who want to become volunteer staff on how to clean up malware off of people's computers, how to clean up root kits, and then, of course, we've got in our wiki, self-help. So if people don't want to interact in the forums, they could just go to our self-help section 
It'll step them through line by line how to clean up their systems. But if that fails, of course, they can always come and into our forums and ask our staff for help. Uh, forums, news, reviews, downloads. Downloads are all security related and distributed computing teams. That, la that last one I just kind of threw in there even though it's not internet crime fighting. Some new services, I put it in quotes because the rootkit forums have been up and running for about a year now. Um, the book has come out earlier this year, about second quarter. It's a book that was completely authored and edited by Castle Cops volunteer staff that focuses on root kits for dummies. And PERT, we launched actually March last year. Here are the two real important bits of information that you'd need to remember in order to participate. The email address, PERT at castlecops.com. Currently, it's a challenge response system. We're trying to move off of that and then the website URL, castlecops.com slash pert. If you log into the site, it'll go ahead and track your submissions. The newer core services are the MERT and the CERT. CERT deals with all spam that's not related to uh, fish, and that's not related to the e-card kind of downloads that you get in email. The e-card kind of stuff goes into the MERT, and with MERT, we put out, as of about yesterday, we've sent out over 500 new, unique malware binaries to over 60 uh, antivirus vendors. So we go out and find this stuff and we send it out to them so that it gets wide distribution and helps protect people. CERT, uh, we'll do everything there, like I said, with the exception of phishing, the e-card stuff, and also the uh, 419. 419, we refer to another organization. We don't want to duplicate efforts. Here's a plethora of actual snapshots of fish sites. The reason why it's been done this way is to give you a little bit of drama. Let's define phishing. Uh, we've defined phishing ourselves, but I tend to refer to phishinginfo.org to kind of get a neutral party involved here. To trick people into providing their personal and financial information by pretending to be from a legitimate company, agency, or organization. Now, I'm, I know that you guys probably already know all this. Uh, the interesting thing with this now is we're starting to see phishing in ICQ. So they're trying to get into social networks. They're trying to break into trusted networks in order to, to, to get deeper access into other areas of your accounts. The problem, phishing of course, which is why I'm here today. Phishing, you know, how's it happen? What's, what, what's the big deal around it? Well, there's botnets, there's DDoSs. We suffered a lot of DDoSs because of phishing, because of our activities out there and trying to combat it. We've had a couple of instances that just this year where folks have tried to nail us with one gigabit per second attacks. Financial loss, fraud domains, identity theft, mules, you familiar with mules? Mules are, um, uh, it's like a third party, so you, you may have a criminal in a third world, third world country trying to get money uh, from a bank, and the banks won't, sit, won't wire that stuff off to a third world country. So what they'll do is they'll try to recruit people in the United States, as an example, who will set up bank accounts, who will act as an intermediary to get the money, the fraudulent money from those banks. Once they get it, they'll go ahead and pass it on to the criminal while they keep a percentage. But ultimately what's up happening is they'll get investigated and they may end up in jail because they participated in the crime. Reputation attacks. Reputation attacks is a brand new one. Um, I jumped ahead. Where's the cursor? Oops. Reputation attacks. Uh, just about a month ago or so, we suffered a brand new attack. The press was writing all about it. There was a lot of uh, accounts that were compromised. Thank you, Tom. There were a lot of accounts that were compromised, credit cards, PayPal accounts, eBay accounts, and the criminals used that 
as a new attack vector against us. So they were using these compromised accounts in order to come at us. They were sending thousands of dollars into our PayPal account. Ultimately, these victims who had their accounts compromised, they came back and were basically reporting us to law enforcement. They thought we were the ones that were stealing their money. So we had to work with PayPal and the FBI in order to get back to them and explain to them, look, we had nothing to do with this. Uh, we're as much victims here as yourselves. So after that, of course, is the spam problem because it all begins with spam. The slide I jumped to, one spam sending Trojan. Victim, that's how a lot of spam gets sent out today through compromised computers. Each of the infected computers is listening on a pre-designated port for commands from the fisher, from the criminal. They then use that, you know, it's a Trojan, they use that to send out their spam campaign. A single infected computer has been observed to send as many as 25 fish emails per minute, 24 by seven. But there's not just one. Remember, we're talking botnet here. There are tens of thousands of these bots. The fishing circle, a uh, nice little slide. You know, you can go around and around, you have your evil hacker, you got your criminal. He or he himself or he may go off to another criminal and lease a bunch of bots from him. So what ended up happening is this evil hacker who wants to run the fish campaign goes to a botnet uses that botnet to send, out, to send out the spam campaign that's gonna target X, Y, and Z brands. These emails get sent out to everybody else. There's gonna be a small percentage that's gonna click on them, go out to these fish. They'll lose their identities. And uh, that information, of course, gets sent off to most likely a uh, compromised web server. Or it could be uh, an ISP like Gmail or Yahoo. That information then gets exploited at the bank and the evil hacker just continues it over and over and over again. The big question is, how many of you have received e phishing emails just, just this week? Can you raise your hands? Keep your hands up. How many of you delete them? Keep your hands up. I hope the, I hope the camera can get a glimpse of this because it's a lot. And it's usually the case, no matter where I go to. Deleting fish emails destroys evidence. We're trying to, uh, we're, we're, we're trying to change the view out there. You know, spam's been a problem for, for, over, for a long time, for over a decade, and everybody just goes ahead and deletes it, or it gets filtered out, and, no, and then the end user never sees it. We're trying to get people to actually think of it as evidence and send it on to the appropriate uh, authorities. In that case, with respect to phishing, we want your emails. Internet fraud starts with an email. Technical solutions. So what is being done today? What are some of the things that you have already may be doing? Solutions for consumers created using technology today is not 100% effective. I think we're all aware of that. Blacklists, URL blocking, IP ranges, artificial intelligence, fingerprinting, mapping, keyword matching. They all get through. Tokens, key fobs that banks have tried to use in the past. They've been broken. Criminals have gotten around them. Phishing still is going on. Frankly, I feel as technical solutions, they're all kind of short term. You know, I mean, we're not really looking at the, at the fundamental problem here. We need to get these people put away. The solution is teamwork and technology. Information sharing. There's a, there's a problem today. You know, there's not a lot of information sharing going on, but when it is going on, we're finding out that the data is valuable and it's, 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 uh, it's helping to open up cases. We'll get into that. We need to have more ISPs provide logs, access logs. We need, to have, we need to have them provide the kits that are found on those servers because phishing takes place, as you may know, uh, by a lot of people today, they just go out and get the kits. Kits are ready made. They can just drop it and run with it, change the email address where the phish data is gonna go to. We need registrars to be able to shut down fraud domains. I'm sure you may have read about uh, um, the Russian business network out there. Uh, it's been said 
that uh, you know there's activity over there that uh, may be setting up fraud domains and phishing and the like. So we try to work with registrars in order to get those fraud domains shut down. Ind industry, you know, we all got to share information. Law enforcement and banks, we need to get them to provide feedback to us. It's kind of hard, especially with law enforcement, because everything's at a law enforcement sensitive or top secret level. They can't really come back and tell us much because that may divulge a little too much of what it is they're trying to do. So this leads to criminal profiling and search warrants and ideally arrests. Teamwork, well, how do we build teamwork? We first need trust. Trust is built on truth. There's a quote that I heard last year, is truth stretches, trust breaks. I love that. And uh, you know, how, how is truth built? Personal relationships and background checks. Fishing is a global problem, therefore we need global teamwork. Industry sharing information. Various agencies track specific criminal activities to help bring, uh, to help build criminal profiles. We need to understand the miscreant social networks, the forums that they participate in, which are now vetted and closed, the IRCs. Fraud, we need to follow the money trail. This is ultimately how we're gonna be able to get those arrests. Otherwise, the technology is just gonna keep doing what it's doing. Emails are still gonna get through and these guys are still gonna be making money day to day. Coupled with technology and trusted sharing, we can protect consumers and arrest these guys. That's what Castle Cops wants. So how do we get this done? Through our PERT solution. Why are we different than anyone else working in the space? A, we believe in sharing that data. We believe in avoiding duplication. And we believe in volunteering to protect the internet. So what is PERT? The what, the why, and the who? PERT, as I stated earlier, is the Phishing Incident Reporting and Termination. It kind of came about a couple of years ago when uh, my wife and I were living in New Jersey and uh, we were pregnant at the time, we were moving. It could have launched the year prior, but because of all the things that were going on in our lives, kind of got pushed back by a year, but we eventually were able to launch it March last year. The idea is we want to quickly take down fish and also shut down the email escapes. Now, there's a little bit of controversy over shutting down fish quickly. Um, there's quite a few folks out there that believe, I'm probably one of them, um, after about four hours or so, the fish, the fisher would pretty much move on to a brand new fish because after four hours being up and running, they can expect guys like us to come in there and get their hands on it. Now, we don't go to fish sites and put in fake data. We don't attack those sites. We just do investigations and we work with others out there to get them shut down. But there are groups out there and individuals that go to fish sites and try to feed bogus data into it. Now the fishers get dirty data, which is why after about a four hour period, it's believed that perhaps they move on. It's not gonna, they're not gonna have a higher return after that, whereas in the first four hours they can because it's, it's you know, these emails have to go through the system and people gotta get alerted to them. Why? Prevent further financial loss. We uh, also provide investigative reports to law enforcement, who, again, volunteers, and the relationships that we've built, built up throughout the industry to help us do our work. Sharing data, we report all our reports uh, free to any, anybody. We've got over 55 organizations that receive our feeds. You can go to castlecops.com slash PIRT and uh, underneath the submission form, you'll be able to see the full updated list of who our partners are. Unlike other organizations, there are no membership fees or our, and our status files are public. Caveat, there is certain information which we do not publicize. For instance, we'll find non-public information, we'll find credit cards, we'll find not all, that kind of, all that kind of information. We don't want to you know, keep weeding the garden, so to speak, where we have to pull it back out again later. So that kind of information we will preserve, but it'll be in a sensitive portion of the report that the public doesn't have access to. Avoiding duplication. We definitely don't want to task our volunteers to the point where they're getting burned out. We don't want them doing uh, duplication of effort. So whenever a URL comes in, it gets assigned to one unique PERT ID, and everything's tied to that. 
If any more come in with that same URL, we up the prevalence and then we track how widespread this URL might be. By centralizing and sharing, we avoid duplication of labor. Volunteering. This is my pitch for trying to recruit you folks. And anybody else, if you want to go around and, and be our recruiters, if you are the sort of person that asks the question, how can you help? Or how can you stop identity theft or help curb it? That PERT is obviously the place for you. We need you. We need this help because the criminals are, uh, you know, some folks think they're winning, some folks think they're not. But they're going to be around so long as we don't get them arrested. Here's the PERT flow. Basically three. The new report, confirmation, and termination. Under new report, there's a whole bunch of automated automation that goes on. And we're adding new automation sequences every day. Today, what happens is the URL comes in. It checks to see if that URL already exists, as I mentioned. If it doesn't, it goes into a new report. There's a prefetcher which will go out and prefetch that uh, source page. It'll do a screen scrape so that we have it preserved right at the time of submission. It'll do a who is, it'll do a dig for, for A and all the other registers. And it'll also do a host. We want to grab as much information from the onset as possible. Confirmation. At that point, the handler will go into the report and will actually manually verify if it's a fish or not. We don't have any false positives. In the beginning, a year and a half ago we did because the automation wasn't there and the procedures weren't there like they are today. But today we don't have any false positives. Any report that gets published must be 100% manually verified by handler. They investigate it. So what will happen is we don't, we're not biased towards any brand. If it's a fish, we'll work it, no matter who it targets, ICQ, any of the banks, anybody out there, we'll go ahead and work it. Sometimes when we go investigate a fish, there might be just one fish on that server. There's no drop files we can find. There's no drop kits, nothing. We can't find anything on there. All we have is just the fish. Other times, there's multiple fish on there. There could be a dozen fish on there. There could be a dozen drop files. There could be uh, five kits. So it really depends. Sometimes you can find yourself working the fish in five minutes. Sometimes you can find yourself working it in two hours. Finish up the report, send it out to everybody. And in termination phase, we'll go ahead and follow up. We'll make sure that it is indeed terminated. Some of our quickest, some of our quickest terminations have been through Yahoo. They've shut it down in about five minutes from receiving our report. Uh, if we didn't acquire, if we did not acquire a kit, in the confirmation phase, we'll try to work with that ISP in order to get that uh, kit so we can continue on in our, in our investigations because we want to find out where this data is going to. We want to shut down those getaway cars. Here's our handler checklist. After getting the ticket from the queue, again, they'll confirm if it's a fish or not. If it is, what brand or brands? Document it, find all the relevant parties. So if it's a fraud domain, for instance, They'll go ahead and contact the ISPs where the fish is operating off of. They'll contact the registrar and say, hey, registrar, this is a fraud domain. You need to reclaim it, please. They'll contact all the brands, let them know. File the report. Again, we wait, confirm termination. And if it's not terminated quickly, then we go ahead and escalate. How do we escalate? Through relationships. Technical. From a technical perspective, we work with Team Cymru. I know Tom is aware of them. Don't know if anyone else here is. MyNet Watchman. We use their data in order to get the BGP origins, possible peers, ASN to abuse email mapping. Of course, we do uh, hashes, dig, host, and who is. Here is a snapshot of our queue. This is uh, an old snapshot you can see back in September 2006. Hasn't changed. So I didn't feel the need to update it. The red under the ID column, the uh, red color signified that the fish is alive. It came back with a 200 response code. The green is like a 404, for instance. It comes back, it, it's seen as terminated. So that's just a quick view for the handler to tell if a fish is up or, up or not. The handler, uh, there's two views into our reports. There's the public view, like I said, and then there's the handler view. Law enforcement has access into the handler view. Um, what, what we see here is the green bar uh, is coming back with the 403 accesses forbidden. So more likely than not, this fish is already down at the, time, at the last time this 
this check was done. Uh, you could see here under the, uh, the entry, the first line is what was submitted to us, and then the code uh, goes in automatically uh, deciphers it in terms of ASCII and URL to help determine um, if the ASCII or the URL decoded line is the one that the handler should be looking at. Here's another example. And here is a fresh snapshot of our handler tools. Now, law enforcement does not have access to us. There's no reason for them to have access to it. Only the handlers do. Uh, there is a search, so you can go ahead and search by duplicates. Now, I did mention, you know, when you get the full URL and you submit it in, it gets tied to one report. That's true. However, there's a lot of fish out there that have a domain and multiple subdomains. So what we'll do is we'll go ahead and do a search on the domain. We'll try to find all those multiple subdomains and then tie it up into this master report. So all those other, one will, all those other reports will become slaves. And we'll work off of one master. That'll get uh, investigated and sent out. And then uh, you've got your titling here. On the left-hand side, title brands. That is a, uh, a selection box that has the listing of all the titles of all the fish that we've come across since May, uh, March of last year. And then the global contacts, that's above and beyond. So in there, we have a section for academic, we have a section for law enforcement, for certs around the world, for ISPs, for registrars, for government. That's all stuff that we put in on the back end. The handler can just select it, over it goes into the middle box and uh, highlight it, click process all, and then the report gets titled. The emails get populated appropriately. This is another portion of the fetch page. There's some things that I haven't included because of security issues. There's some portions of the tool that I don't want to you know, display on, on TV. However, if you want to come join us as handlers, you will get your, your fill of it. Uh, here's the fetch page. The handler can go ahead and put in the URL that they want to fetch. And we go through an anonymous proxy network, not a Tor, not anything like that. We go through it because we noticed earlier this year that uh, we were being blocked. We could not fetch, we could not screen scrape fish because people were actually blocking Castle Cops IPs. So we needed to do something drastic by going to an anonymous proxy. And that has helped big time. Occasionally, you know, it doesn't get through. So we have a little switch in there for bypassing the proxy. The green bar there for ASN, BGP, step one and step two, that's where we go ahead and in the first box, step one, we put the IP in. We figure out who is the, uh, uh, the responsible ASN. And once we get that ASN, we put it into step two, that's where we get the responsible email. There's some ISPs out there where we have direct access into their abuse department. Then there's the ad handler note and then the law enforcement sensitive data. So the non-public information will get put into the right box. And that's the data that law enforcement and handlers can continue to see but the public cannot. We've recently started working with banks so that they can go in here into their brand. It's called my brand, so they can go into here and they can see this information themselves directly, but they won't be able to see other reports. They'll only be able to see their brand. There's a blind contact list. Um, there's a lot of organizations that love what we do. They don't want us to share their information with the rest of the world. So we've developed our own blind contact list. In the left-hand side, well, you've already seen a portion on this on the, on the previous slide. It's basically the same thing. The right global contacts as well as the left have email mappings to them. Some are public, some are private. By private, when an email gets sent out, it just gets placed into the BCC. Here's an example of what some of the notes look like in the report. And then here's an example of the fetch. Right now, the fetch is all ASCII. So we put everything into a database back end. As you can see, we've got the, uh, the response headers as well. We're, we're working on getting to an image snapshot. So we not only want to capture the, the ASCII portion of the, uh, the HTML of the fish, we also want to be able to get the snapshot. 
and tie that to the report. So when law enforcement or a researcher comes to look at the fish, they'll be able to see exactly what that page looked like without having to reconstruct it from the ASCII. Here's what the ASNs look like. As I said in step one, you put the IP in, it gives you the information, 9970, 8972, sorry. And then you get the peers. With the peers at this point, we don't do anything with them because they're possible, they're not a guarantee. And then when the email gets sent out, this is what it looks like. The two contains all the public addresses. The CC contains standard stuff. We'll, we're, we're reporting to APWG. We're reporting to US CERT, IC3. And in the subject, we have uh, the PERT ID, the brands that are affected, and then the responsible ASs, because a lot of these folks, we belong on some private lists. And a lot of these ISPs belong on those same lists, so what they'll do is they've got filters set up on the subject. They'll monitor for their, their AS uh, number. So anything that, they, that comes across their filters goes right to them. They're alerted and they start acting on it. Our standard email body, you just go ahead and alert them right away. Hey, we've noticed, we've observed the fish operating on your server. Here's the URLs. Here's a reference ticket that they can go ahead and look at. We also tell them, we suggest to them to contact us with any further information. If they don't wanna work with us, they're more than welcome to work with our partners in the FBI. In this case, we work with special agent, supervisory special agent, Mike Eubanks, out of the NCFTA, uh, out in Pittsburgh. NCFTA is a, uh, is a 501c3. They uh, operate in such a venue where law enforcement, industry, and academia can come together and share information. Brief snapshot of who, uh, uh, who the other organizations are that receive our feed. Again, this list is outdated. You can go to that URL and see um, who's current and other information that, that's useful for them. Here's a, uh, an example of a prolific PayPal fish. At this time, back on October 17th, it couldn't connect to it. But as you can see, that was the original URL. This particular fish had, it operated off of seven different ASNs. It was spread over multiple locations. ALGX.net, NANCO, SE, SD, Men's Division, NANCO, I, oh, both NANCO, ICSS Talk or ICS Stock, Web Server Systems, WNS Code, JP, RH Pro NT. 15 abuse contacts were put into the email. And primary link ran off of XO Communications. So this was a pretty interesting fish. You don't come across something like this every day. Needless to say, that was not a five minute investigation. Uh, we also have an XML feed. This is one of the ways that we go ahead and feed everybody out there. Uh, it's free upon request, formatted by per ID, report ID, lists all originating ASNs, displays all the fish URLs. So if we have a master-slave relationship, it will list the master as well as the slaves. There's been instances where we've got hundreds of slaves linked up to the one master. It references a public PERT report, displays up, down, or, or not available status, reveals the originating IPs, and it shows the confirmed terminated. The confirmed terminated is what the handler actually manually flips. It also go, we also have a private uh, Castle Cops PERT listserv for partners. You can find out more about the tool, if there's gonna be any changes, and we also have additional discussions on there that are not public. The only thing we ask for in return is just public recognition. Put a link up on your site or something along those lines. Now let's get to some pretty interesting stuff. I was on the phone last night getting this data. Law enforcement provided metrics based on PERT activity from May 2006 to August 07. Now yes, we did start in March of last year. However, we did not start working with law enforcement until May timeframe. In that period, uh, we've identified 1,800, well, it's more now, over 1,860 drop email accounts that these criminals were using in their phishing campaigns to try and escape with customer data. Uh, as of last night, 1,600 deactivated and evidence preserved on these accounts. Uh, 2,500 fish were actually targeted by these emails, so 2,500 fish that were up and running had these emails um, as drop accounts. 
And because of all the work that we've done, it's been figured out on average, three fish campaigns are done per email account. An average of 33 people respond per fish per account. We've seen it where it was just one. We've seen it where it was four or 500. So the average turns out to be 33 people. So I've uh, taken it from 99 to 100 good victim data. The value to each card is $5,000, according to several U.S. court districts. Realistic loss is anywhere between $300 to $1,500 per card. Via research, again, the $100 per email, $500 we're working it at, it comes to $50K per email account. The total realistic, very conservative economic loss prevented, thanks to PERT, at 1,600 accounts times 100 cards, times $500 per card is $80 million. We've prevented from these criminals escaping. Uh, because it's not a closed environment out there in security, we want to work with everybody. These, the relationships that we've established through certain countries out there, we've been able to get malware key logging data. And that has given us 1,500 additional email accounts in that same period which has prevented an additional $75 million from being stolen. So uh, since we got into this March of last year, we've helped to save over $150 million. Not bad. Several dozen criminal cases opened up by U.S. law enforcement, linked back to PERT data. And this is why it's crucial. We need volunteers. Without the volunteers, we would not be getting these kinds of metrics. Probable cause developed for numerous search warrants. Thousands of, identified, of identity theft fraud victims have been notified and identified. Let's take a look at this year. Gmail and Yahoo have been two of the biggest email providers out there that have been used in order for criminals to try and escape with customer data. The value, freely share fish information, source code saved for law enforcement, Kits are obtained, all brands are processed, we're not biased. Botnets are revealed, obfuscated code is translated. We do fish takedown and consumer protection. Now, I did mention again earlier that there's a little bit of controversy as to how quick fish should be taken down. The reason why I brought up the four hours is because a lot of folks get to these fish after the four hour period. And these, a lot of folks out there are still operating under the assumption of, we need to get this shut down now. If they get it shut down now, there's no preservation done. There's nothing tying these people to a crime, which is where PERT is different. We, when we come upon a fish, no matter, if it's, no matter if we got it a minute ago, no matter if we got it two months ago and we're finally getting to it, we want to preserve that data. That's what's helping to open up cases. PERT is active in the trenches searching for fish. We help keep the FBI up to date on new trends as they happen as opposed to a place like the Internet Fraud Complaint Center where they, they have to wait for consumers to actually call in and complain about fraud. Our data helps build better criminal profiles and drop emails are reported, thus stopping further financial loss. We've helped identify Eastern European crime groups and individuals, helped identify victim companies and which relationships need to be developed. And certain reports, of course, again, led to investigations opening up by uh, law enforcement. Here is an almost up-to-date, about 99% up-to-date list of our relationships, all the groups and organizations out there that get our feed. Summary, we are a policy-based organization. We work with agencies to terminate fish legally and quickly, law enforcement, certs, ISPs, and registrars. We're not in the business of hacking. We are a vetted volunteer agency. If you are an InfraGuard member, for instance, we consider you to be vetted, but that's not 100% because we still need to get your information into the team and the team makes the final decision. We share our data and reports on fish, and we report on fish uh, on the server, all fish without bias. Here's a graph of that one, of one of the one gigabit per second attacks that we had against us. So how can you help, ultimately, by sending fish in? Don't delete the fish. We want that as evidence. Pertacastlecops.com. 
or you can go to the website. If you create an account and log in, it'll go ahead and track you. We've got a top 15. Some people are into that. Uh, if you, you want to do more, uh, set up sensors. We're always looking for sensors. We've got some academic institutions around the world that have set up sensors for us. We get sanitized fish into us, so we don't see who the recipient is. All that identifying information is stripped. However, we still get the fish from them, and that gets us more into a more global picture. Nobody has a true global picture on fishing at the moment. That's one thing that we're striving to do. We're trying to get fish from all over the world so that we can get more data. Data is vital. Share your information with industry. Law enforcement is what we preach. Volunteer is a pert handler. Come see me. Submit, submit, submit those fish. And here is my contact information. I'm on LinkedIn. If anybody else is, you can see my uh, profile on there. And the biggest uh, email to remember is pert at castlecops.com. As an aside for Mert and Cert, we do not have emails up and running yet. Uh, it's something that I will be setting up shortly, I hope. Thank you. Are there any questions? Uh, fishing sites are generally shut down in about four hours. Do you still want phishing emails that we get if we don't get them till the next day or clean up a mail junk mail filter once a day? Yes. We've come across fish um, that have actually been up and running for more than a month. Fish against big brands. These brands have their own internal infrastructure set up to take these things down and they also contract out with vendors to help. And yet we still come across fish that should not be operating but are. But in addition to that, we help track the prevalence. So um, how do you do your training program for volunteers? We have tried a couple of different ideas. We put those theories into practice for training. We've had a situation where I or another trained individual would go ahead and train a group of people. We, would, we run our own secure Jabber server. Everybody gets accounts. We put them into a Jabber training room. Everybody goes into that Jabber training room and then we just, we walk everybody through. There's, we also have documentation that people can read in advance and read through when we're stepping through the training. So we get everybody into a room virtually, and just step through the training. That could take about two hours. Excuse me. However, that may be enough for some people, may not be enough for some people, which is why we started to break into mentoring, where we take some of the advanced handlers who are able to run on their own, no problem, they'll sync up with maybe one or two trainees and check in on their work. So after the big group training, they will go ahead, work the report up to a certain point because trainees cannot send out reports. They cannot generate those emails. They can only go up to the generation of the email and at that point, a full handler must come in and click the, hey, let's generate this thing and send it out to the world. At that point, the mentor can come in, look over the work, and tell the trainee, okay, this is great, or you need a little bit more work in this aspect. Uh, that's, that's pretty much it at this point. Our documentation is on file with uh, the FBI, so they are fully aware of what we do. What is the profile of a typical handler, and how many hours a week do you think they spend on this? The real active handlers, that's a good question. The real active handlers that we have today have pretty much been with us since the beginning. The profile of a handler, that's a real good question. Nobody's ever asked me that before. Uh, well, to answer one aspect of your question, they will probably sit there and work the reports anywhere from two to five hours a day and they'll probably end up doing it five or six days a week. 
uh, a lot of the reports that they work probably take more than a half hour. So we don't get out a high volume, but the ones that we do get out, it's nice to see get out because it's making an impact. Um, they are all basically into IT. We've had a couple of folks that, are, that were not. However, we train them doing all this investigation and now they're experts. As to uh, personal, personal lives, um, you know, they're just regular people. You know, just the adults, adults just like you and, you and me. Some are grandparents, some are parents, and they just want to be able to give back. Everybody is passionate about, uh, about PERT, and that's basically typical of the rest of our volunteers. You know, like I said, we have about 120 active volunteer staff, and every, each of those people are involved in various aspects of the site. And they all have that passion to give back and to do good. It's just that some folks would rather clean up malware, some folks would rather take care of the malware database lists, some folks would rather dive into PERT. The PERT service is one of the toughest, one of the most challenging uh, services that we provide that a handler can work or any volunteer can work because like I said, one report you could work on for a couple of hours depending on how difficult it is. Does that answer your question? Good. That answers your question. Paul, is the organization international or is it US based? Or it's international. Uh, whereabouts do you have people from? We have people from the UK, from Australia, from New Zealand. We've got people from all over the world. Please join me in thanking Paul for coming all the way from Worcester to downtown Cleveland. And um, I, I thank you for your time and effort. Thanks very much. Thank you, Tom.